Okay, so we're going to continue on with our soldering uh, series. This one's on some of your basic soldering equipment. I'm not going to cover really any techniques. Um, this is only on hand soldering equipment and supplies and kind of stuff you can use and what you should have. Um, I'm not going to cover really surface mount. This is mainly going to cover uh, your through hole components and older. So, you know, your old wire tie style uh, or hand wired radios like on uh, tube radios and whatnot. I will, in the future, I plan on doing a, a bunch of videos on uh, surface mount, on different techniques for doing that kind of work, and then eventually even on doing circuit uh, board and trace repairs. This one, like I say, is mainly on your hand, hand work for through hole and early point-to-point uh, -point wiring. So this is on equipment. I think a lot of people have problems soldering because they're using the wrong soldering iron. They go out and buy a soldering iron and they buy a good one. You know, they don't buy a cheap one. Here's a good example. Here's a Weller. This is a W60P, 60 watt soldering iron. I used this thing for years. Um, hasn't been plugged in for uh, God knows how many years now. Uh, I no longer need it. I have much better soldering irons. Um, but it works just fine. I did the majority of my soldering with this. But there's a point only so much you can do. And there are two things that dictate what a soldering iron can do. How many watts and the tip. The bigger a component you're soldering, the more wattage you need. The bigger the component you're also soldering, the bigger tip you need. So this one was fine for through hole components. You know, you're doing a cap job on a radio. You're replacing all the electrolytic capacitors or just normal repair or, or building something. This soldering iron's perfectly fine. Um, and this tip is perfectly fine. You start getting into working on uh, old tube radios. This soldering iron, probably not the best. The tip's a little bit small. It may have enough thermal reserve, which is the amount, uh, the thermal reserve is how much heat is, heat energy is stored inside this iron and ready for immediate use. It doesn't have to make it, you know, it, it'll, that's the whole idea behind the heating element is it can replace that thermal reserve as the heat is being used. So, very important. Um, but like I say, tip size. Very, you know, size does matter sometimes, and when it comes to soldering irons, there's no place it's more true where size does matter. So, you can get soldering irons in all kinds of sizes. Like I say, for your standard soldering, most electronics, I guess for the average Joe, a, a iron this size is just fine. Um, I'd suggest getting a good one. Get an Unger, Weller, you know, you don't have to go out and buy a... Uh, you'll see in some of my later videos, some of my several thousand dollar uh, soldering machines, like when I get into my, my Pace PRC 2000 uh, multi-process machine, um, you know, hot air equipment, man, you, you can easily get into uh, five figures for, uh, you know, how much soldering equipment costs. But here's your standard soldering iron. Now, one disadvantage of this is, what's on the end of this? A plug. It's non-adjustable for heat. Now, you can get... Uh, power supplies, basically, for your hand soldering iron. So this would plug into a little small trans auto transformer on the bench, and you can adjust adjust the voltage that's then going to the soldering iron to, you know, to raise or lower the temperature. Um, you can even have stuff like that. This power supply on the back side has another plug, and that's what this is for right here, this knob. That controls the output power, and you can see it says soldering temp. So that, that can be used for adjusting the tip temperature on this iron. A step up from that is going to be uh, a dedicated soldering iron machine. Now, this iron here is one of them, and this is probably one of my most used. It's one of my daily drivers between this and one of my pace irons. Um, this is a Heiko. Now you can get a bunch of different, the, the actual base power supply units. This is, right now it's attached to a Heiko 936, and this is, I think, a 907. It's so used, yeah. It's right there. I don't even know if you can see it anymore. It actually is so worn off from years of use, but it's a 907. Um, very good irons. 
avoid cheap knockoffs because the Heiko 930 six power supplies and the 907 irons are probably the most counterfeited soldering iron on the planet. If you go on eBay, you will see dozens if not hundreds of these things for sale and probably 80 or 90 percent of them are fake. Especially if they're coming from China, they're probably not the real thing. Um, very high quality irons. Very easy to change the tips on these and they have a very large assortment of tips that you can get from large to very very small for doing surface mount work. This iron tip here perfectly fine for doing 90 probably plus percent of what I solder. So most of my all my through hole work and a large majority of the uh, you know wire the soldering on old point to point tube type wiring is done with this iron with this tip. And this tip, this is a chisel tip. It's not round like this one. You can see it is bigger in size. But this one works for the large majority of it. Um, but still, it can only do so much. Now you can get, uh, a lot of people are familiar with the Weller irons that have the, the loop on the end. Okay, I used to use those occasionally. I personally never really liked them that much. They have really no thermal reserve um, because it's basically just a hot wire, what I call a hot wire iron. It's just a piece of bent looped wire on the end that gets hot and there's no reserve so as soon as the tip touches it sucks all the heat rate out of it so that the iron is always trying to keep up to keep the temperature up. Um, this old hexacon is a very good iron. Um, I've used this thing for decades, works great. You know, it's one, one temperature, if that does have a downfall. Um, but it's, this is a 150 watt iron, has a good thermal reserve built in, so there's a lot of heat energy stored in this thing. You can see it's a fairly wide tip. Good for doing, you know, uh, mainly point to point. You're not going to be using this much in modern electronics. But uh, you can do some minor, maybe chassis soldering with this. But even this 150 watt iron, you're pushing the limits of 150 watts trying to solder copper wires to a steel chassis. When you want to start doing that, you really want to start getting up into the big boys. And that's where American Beauty comes in. They've been around for decades. Here's one iron right here, and probably my one of my personal favorites. Now this is a 300 water, and you can see the size, you know, com compared to my hand, <laughs> how big this is. Okay, and especially when you compare it to the midget beside it. This thing will solder pretty much anything to anything. <laughs> it has a huge thermal reserve. I love solder doing chassis work with this thing because it's an absolute breeze. I don't care how thick the steel chassis is. I Honestly, I can solder a piece of wire to a piece of one inch thick plate steel with this. Um, properly prepared, you just stick this iron on there and you just... It, it never seems to run out, it, it, but you can look at the physical size of this thing. It is an absolute monster, and an, you know an electric meter spinner too, because it's such a big iron. Like I say, it's a 300 watt iron. Um, I even have one that's even bigger than this and has even a bigger tip. But for the majority of stuff, this is really all you need. Um, I, I'm talking for the biggest stuff. Uh, and you know, soldering copper shields, uh, RF shields to uh, steel chassis. This thing works fantastic. Like I said, now disadvantage of this thing because it's so monstrous it takes a long long time to heat up we're talking 15 to 20 minutes to get up to full operating temperature but once it gets there it is almost impossible to suck the heat you know the the, the thermal reserve or the, you know the heat energy that's stored in this thing it's almost impossible to drain this thing it just you know it's worth waiting all that time it's a pleasure to solder with something like this so i can move this out of the way and move this one out of the way. And you can get the American Beauties. These were some popular stands a lot of times. You'll see them, you know, if you pick these up used, you'll see them with these nice stands. Um, they are very nice stands. That way you're not burning yourself. Uh, so, you know, something to keep an eye out for. They have this little clamping bracket down here. So, I don't know what exactly they were designed for. Clamping to a piece of wood or something. But uh, I've got five or six of these stands. Never have figured out exactly what they were designed to be clamped to, but I could care less. I just use them as bench top. They sit like that. So, 
let's move some of these irons out of the way. Like I said, that's very important. But a soldering iron is only a small portion of what's important when you're soldering. The next thing is going to be solder. Now, there are more flavors of solder than there probably are, and, and flux, fluxes than there probably are of anything else. Uh, there's different sizes, different compositions of metal, um, different wire thicknesses. Uh, pick, pick which one you want. Probably one of the most popular is going to be Kester 44. It's been around forever, long before I was born. My uncle used it, and grandfather used it in the radio TV repair business. Uh, honestly, I don't use it anymore. It's a 6040 alloy. It's a lead tin alloy, and it's not that I'm uh, against it. It is an excellent solder. It's just, personally, I've switched to a silver solder for everything that I do. I do so many mobile radios, and the silver solder has... Uh, more mechanical strength. So in mobile applications where you you have to worry about components just from vibration, you end up with bad solder joints, heavy components can, you know, because mo in most radios the components are hanging upside down. Components, it'll tend to break those solder joints. The silver solder has a uh, higher tensile strength. And I find it actually solders even easier. But there's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with this Kester 44. It's been around so long for the simple reason it is so good. Like I say, I use a SN62 as my daily driver. This is a Urson multi-core solder, okay? So there's actually several cores of flux inside of this solder. And then here's a Kester. This is also silver solder. So... These are what I mainly use. Now, like I say, it also comes down to diameter. I've got some solder that's close to four times the diameter of this stuff. This is, you know, 062. Good for really big, uh, you know, point-to-point -point wiring on hand-wired stuff and tube radios. Uh, for the majority of my through-hole component work, everything that I do, I'm using something about this size. This is a point zero two eight. You can see there. Uh, so somewhere between point zero two eight and point zero three two is what I use for most of my through-hole work. Um, if it's really small, uh, some of the more modern circuit boards, not through hole yet, but uh, you know, even through hole components and the circuit boards are starting to shrink down, especially if it's a, a hybrid board where it has surface mount and through hole components like most stuff does. You're going to want to switch to even something even smaller. You know, here's a .020, you know, very thin. Now I have some that's even thinner than that for doing strictly uh, surface mount work. But uh, I've kind of gotten away from that because pretty much everything I do now with surface mount, I'm, nowadays I do hot air and I'm using solder paste. But like I say, this one's mainly on hand soldering. So, you know, 028 to 032 is probably a perfect size for the average user. That's a good, you know, good diameter. It's not too big. It's, you know, this is way too big for doing normal through hole, component, through hole components. But this, by the same token, this is way too small. You'll just be... You'll spend all day pushing solder in because it's so damn thin. This is just about the right size for through-hole components. So, you know, there's your solder. Now, all of these solders have flux in them already. But especially when you're working on uh, old electronics uh, or new old stock parts, you'll find that the component leads are oxidized. Um, they can even be green and corroded. That's where the flux comes in. Now, you can get flux... I have to reach out. Should I actually lay this down? Get up here and grab a tube and another little tub. But you can get now inside of this syringe is just some of this SRA flux paste. You can get paste fluxes. You can get now probably my favorite and what I use the most is a uh, uh, my own little homebrew. It's just this Californium. It's a uh, German. It's a rosin cake. Get the lid off here. And it's literally just that. It's pure rosin. You can see down in there it's it's hard as a rock. Okay. And then what I do is I just get in there with a razor knife, break break it up, scrape it around, I dissolve it, but there's about one and a half cakes in this bottle. Um, works extremely well. And 
like I say, when you're working on vintage stuff, you really can use that extra cleaning action because that's what the flux does. It's, it, it is what's cleaning and preparing the surface as the solder starts to flow onto it. So especially if it's a contam you know, partially contaminated surface or an old surface, the more flux, the better. You know, there probably is such a thing as too much flux, but yeah, it's, it's hard to get there. The more, the more flux, the better is kind of my philosophy because you can always clean the flux off if you get too much on there. If you didn't apply enough flux at the beginning, and you're especially if you're working on through-hole components on a circuit board, if, you have, if you're soldering iron on your trace too long, you can eventually delaminate or you know break the bond between the copper trace and the board, and now your traces are loose. So, you know, good flux it does its job. Uh, be cautious of fumes. Um, I have a actual paste fume extractor with a hood that I use. Uh, but just a simple fan, good ventilation for you know the hobby, the hobby solderist. Um, do something though. The last thing you want to do is put your head directly over a, st a stream of you know curly smoke coming up off of your soldering iron and be breathing that in because there's all kinds of toxic fumes in there to include hydrochloric acid. Um, so not not good for the lungs or your eyeballs for that matter. So even just a little fan blowing off to the side, blowing the fumes, but to keep them away from your face. Uh, desoldering. Um, now I can get into, and I'll, that'll probably be in the later. I'll get into actual desoldering, a, a lot of the desoldering equipment at a later date. But I mean, you can get good, you know, desoldering equipment. You know, vacuum, big my big process machines, and I'll get into those in a separate video. But for the average user, you know, that's probably too expensive. Uh, God, I need to dig that thing out. Where is it at? Actually, here it is. Another piece of equipment I haven't used for decades. <laughs> but uh, there's lots of things you can do for desoldering. A lot of people are probably familiar with the old vacuum suckers. Okay, now there's cheap and good ones. You know, these are Jensen. Um, I know Jensen didn't make them, but these are good, high quality solder suckers. Um, these work by applying the soldering iron with one hand to melt the solder, and then you come in with the solder sucker and suck the solder out with the other. The disadvantage is. Honestly, they don't do that that great a job. Um, they're great for huge pools of solder, but they, it's like through hole components, they'll never remove all of the solder. That's where the sod desoldering machines really shine. But you can get the large majority of the solder sucked off with this. And same thing with one of these vacuum ball desoldering irons. I just keep this one around because it's a good demonstration purpose. I never really liked them, so I don't use them. But uh, they do work somewhat. One of the big problems I see, and I've had people send me radios to work on, and I can I can instantly look at the circuit board until they used one of these. And they screwed up in their technique because they stick the soldering iron on, you know, they wait for the tip, the tip's hot, they squeeze the solder ball, or actually that's the problem. They put this, put this down and push out, or then suck or when they're come on the, while they're on their way down to the board to the next one, they're squeezing this ball and it's it sprays out solder, molten solder onto the circuit board. Now they have shorts all over their board. I have seen boards with literally 30, 40, 50 shorts on it because they were squeezing this ball while the soldering iron was over top of the board. When you use one of these, you should before you bring the, the iron over the board, you should squeeze the bulb, place it on on the solder connection, you want to desolder, suck out the solder, move away, and then, let's say this is a container, you know, get all the solder out of the tip over that container. Um, and then when you're ready to desolder the next one, squeeze the ball, then come over top of the board. But don't be squeezing this thing when you're over top of the board, because you're going to be spraying solder onto the board, causing shorts. Now you're going to have to troubleshoot why your equipment doesn't work. So... They're good if they work, like I say, somewhat if used properly. Um, but once you've gotten it desoldered somewhat with one of these and these, then you can switch to your desoldering braid. Now this will suck the rest of the solder out. This stuff works great. I use it not on a daily basis, but there's even even with all the equipment that I have, there are still times that I use desoldering braid. I'll never be able to do without it. It's great stuff. Uh, buy good desoldering braid dough, and you should avoid old stock. Now, I don't mean it's maybe a year or two old, but if you see boxes of it, I actually have one here, because I have several hundred rolls of this. 
I got a couple cases of this at an auction. It's not that I got stuck with it. It was just part of a lot that I got. But this stuff, it's probably not as old as me, but it's just judging by the box, it's definitely got some age to it. I don't see any dates on it anywhere. So, yeah, in any case, if I try to use this stuff, it doesn't work. It's just, I stick it on there. This, I can see the solder melt. This won't suck anything up. The flux is just, it's lost its oomph, I guess you could say, over the years. And the, the braid is also slightly oxidized. Now, if you get something like this that doesn't work, and you're a penny pincher, you can still use this. But what you need, and that's where this comes in handy, is some of this liquid flux that you've mixed up. You can just apply some of this to this braid right here. And there it's basically been refluxed, and it will work again. So, just a little tip, if you have some old old uh, soldering, desoldering braid that doesn't work really well, add a little bit of liquid flux to it. You might be surprised it might actually start to work again. But, I just keep this box around to remind me, stay away from old solder braid, <laughs> or desoldering braid. Um, other tools of the trade are cleaning your work, for preparations, that is. Um, you know, you can go from the scraper ends, you know, these have almost like a little knife edge, got lots of these things, you know, this has a knife, almost like a spatula knife blade on the end, you know, all kinds of scrapers, there's wire brushes for getting really nasty corrosion off and whatnot, um, little picks for getting in, you know, scraping off all that crunchy stuff, but probably some of my favorite tools are the fiberglass brushes, there are actually a lot of products made by a company called Rush Eraser. Um, actually, here's a box for... Okay, and it has all kinds of little... You can get all different kinds of brushes. You can get fiberglass brushes, plastic brushes. Here's... Actually, this is the brush that came in this box. This is a stainless steel brush. Very, very hard. Great for getting off really heavy oxidation residues and whatnot. But... Like I say, you can get all different kinds. Now, these get really expensive. The rush erasers, especially when you get the ones in the metal housings, these, they're not cheap. I'm going to be completely honest with you. But I think they have some of the hardest fiberglass. These things are hard as a rock. And if you're cleaning corroded circuit traces, the, the rush erasers are really good because you can literally, these are so abrasive, they will wear through the copper trace completely. I mean, you can just wipe traces off of a board with these things. They're, they're great but really good at removing heavy oxidation and corrosion from like if you had an electrolytic capacitor leaking. For the majority of my just general cleanup, I use these. Be completely honest, eBay is where I get a lot of my stuff. Very light, fluffy brushes. You know, you can see I'm brushing my finger with it. You don't have to worry about impaling yourself with little fibers of glass because these things, like I say, really, really flexible and fluffy. Great for cleaning up circuit traces. Um, old terminal tie boards, or even the leads on components. If you use new old stock, really old stock, the leads, you know, the wire leads on your components will be oxidized. They won't accept solder. Clean it up with one of these little fiberglass brushes. I, I can't overstate that enough how, how well these little things work. And they don't cost that much, you know, especially for these cheap ones. Now, like I say, I'm kind of slanted towards the rush erasers, but I've found myself, I use these cheap Chinese ones just about as much as I do my Made in the USA rush erasers. So, but cleaning, it's very important to clean, clean, uh, you know, surface before you start to, to solder. Uh, probably lastly is going to be cleanup. After you're, you're done soldering, you now need to clean all of that flux off. Now, a lot of people don't. I do. I clean, I'm very thorough with cleaning flux off. People ask me, well, what do you use? Well, I, I do have cans of, like, Chemtronics uh, flux off that I use, but that stuff gets expensive. And there's different ones for different types of flux, because there's, there's SRA fluxes. You've got organic fluxes and different flux removers for different types of fluxes. Honestly, for 99.9% .9 of my flux removal, I use 99.9% .9 isopropyl alcohol. Get them in these quart spray bottles. You can get gallon jugs, five gallon. Hell, you can buy 275 gallon RBC containers, returnable bulk containers, if you were so so inclined. But uh, 
I like these. You can get, uh, I think you can get these on eBay even from this company. But you know, it's 99.9% .9 isopropyl alcohol, but it comes in a spray bottle. Now, be extremely, extremely careful. Like another thing I can't overstate enough, this stuff is holy shit flammable because it is pure isopropyl alcohol. It's what they burn in Bunsen burners, so be careful. The slightest flame or spark, you don't want your bench going up in flames, and definitely if your face is over top of it. So when you're using this stuff, especially in a spray bottle, you know, a little container like this, a little bit on a, you know, a towel might be one thing, but when you're spraying it with something like this, absolutely no open flames or sparks uh just use caution um you know chem wipes like i say the little you know dispensers you know foam swabs these things are great i stopped using q-tips years ago because i was always the the never-ending battle of trying to get all these little fibers off especially if i'm cleaning off surface mounts or some you know, small stuff these little these are surgical swabs, so they're you know they're sterile and there's there's no residue there's because they're they're foam. Now if you get the really big ones, I actually have some of them. They're even bigger around. They actually have a Q-tip, a regular Q-tip on the inside, surrounded by a little foam ball, so they you know, can hold a lot of liquid. But foam foam swabs are great for doing small cleanups. Um, when I'm doing a whole circuit board, when I get done doing a radio, and we'll just use this box of Kim wipes as a good example. If this was the circuit board, I just got done soldering. Let's say this side. I just got done soldering it. What I actually do is I stand the radio up on end. I lay a microfiber towel on the underside. I literally just spray the entire circuit board down with it. Come in with my little scrub brush here and scrub all that. And it just, you'll see it's almost like a sheet. Just all the gunk and grime just rolls off of it. Once I get done cleaning all of the, the flux residue off of it, there's going to be a, a haze over top of it. Now you don't have to. I do. I'm anal. Um... I take a, this is actually, I don't know if it'll show up in the camera or not. There you go. You can see here's a medical logo. I got a bunch of these when I was, yes, it says U.S. I got a bunch of these when I was in the Army. The seven special forces got these from the uh, the medics. But uh, they're, fing they're meant for surgeons for cleaning their nice, soft, fluffy bristles. But I actually, once I get done cleaning the board, then I, the last thing I do after it's dried, and it's got that little bit of haze on it, I just go in and buff it up. Now, I'm not going to be doing this on stuff that's static-sensitive, obviously, because this is not an ESD brush. But for the majority of work on most radios, this work, this thing works just fine. I don't have to worry about ESD. Once the components are... If, if there are any ESD-sensitive components, once they're on the board, they're pretty much grounded. I don't have a problem. So, you know, clean, clean, clean. Um, speaking of cleaning, one of the most important things when you're soldering is a clean tip. Now, there's two methods to doing that. You can use the shocking sponge, or you can use the brass wool style. For years, I used the shocking sponge. Um, I did read some articles, have seen some, uh, I think it was pasted. Uh, they, because that's what they sell with their machines. They have the, the but they, what they call the shocking sponge, and then they actually have a brush. They actually have a brush built in, uh, and you'll see that in some of my future videos brush built into their stands um but somewhere i can't remember where it was and it kind of made sense to me you've got this ultra heated piece of metal and now you're applying it to room basically room temperature water that's really hard on these tips and it kind of makes sense you can get micro fractures in in the the plating on these tips so yeah i kind of got away from using the shocking sponges and i've gone to using these uh brass wools uh you know, this one's old. I think actually both of these things are Radio Shack. Back when there used to be Radio Shacks everywhere. Yeah, it's Radio Shack and actually... Yeah, that's Radio. The stand is also Radio Shack as well. Now, um, almost, not, not in between every single solder joint, but as soon as I start to see any amount of flux buildup and gunk residue on this tip, clean it off. That's, like I say, so important. Clean your tip, clean your... I just can't overstate that. Cleaning the tip of your soldering iron is so important to good soldering. Um, just for convenience purposes, buy yourself some sort of stand. Now, I've had this one for decades. This thing's old. It's an old Radio Shack stand. Now, I use this thing for more than just the soldering iron. I actually, because I got so used to it, I started to use it for some of my desoldering irons. Now, these things are a lot heavier than the standard soldering iron. And I'd stick it in here, and it would kind of it would fall over. So, this thing is now very heavy. 
yeah, you can see how heavy it is. It weighs about three pounds and something. Well, that's because there's about two, two and a half pounds of solder in the bottom side of this. You take that little screw out. Originally, this has had this little steel plate as a weight. Well, you can see in the underside there that is a solid mass of solder. There's like two and a half spools of actually this solder right here, 6040 solder, because I've got like 50, 40, 50 pounds of 6040 solder. And like I say, don't use it anymore. And a lot of it's just old, really old stock. So I'm not going to be soldering with it. Great for weighting down stuff like this. You will never tip this soldering iron stand over. I mean, no matter how hard I push on it, you can see it just, nothing can tip it over anymore. It's tip proof. Um, and actually, I did that for a specific reason. For a long time, what I was using the sponge for, you can see it's actually glued into the stand because I wasn't using it to clean tips. That's what I was using this for. I'd use this to hold stuff, you know, pieces of wire, my tip cleaners for my desoldering irons and whatnot. And occasionally, if I would knock it over, all that shit falls out. And it was just, I, I finally got fed up one day. And that's where the, reach down and grab it, the 300 watt soldering iron comes in handy. Because I can literally unspool an entire one pound spool of solder. I had this thing upside down, laid a blob, one pound blob of solder in there, just stick this iron on top of it, and in a matter of like two seconds, it melted a pound of solder into a molten pool. And so, like I say, there's like two, two and a half pounds of solder melted in the underside of that thing. But, you know, like I said, that's really nice. I don't have to worry. This thing, it just doesn't go anywhere. It's just, you know, it's so heavy. So that pretty much covers a lot of your hand soldering equipment. Like I say, this has absolutely nothing to do with technique. This was just going over some of the stuff that, uh, you know, if you don't have, you might consider buying. Um, you know, I understand a lot of people are on a budget, so they're using the vacuum suckers or the solder balls and whatnot. But, uh, you know, if you plan on doing electronics a long time, you know, try and start to invest in some of the better equipment. Buy yourself a good soldering iron, you know, with an adjustable temperature, you know, and if you eventually get into it full time, you may you know consider buying really high end equipment like Pace. So, uh, like I say, in the future, keep an eye out for some videos on stuff like that because uh, I'm going to be doing a lot more videos on some of the more advanced soldering techniques. So, more to come in the future.